This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, everybody. I didn't hear the introduction, so I apologize. I've got some wonky internet service here at um, our facility. So if I do cut out, I will be back. Um, so rest assured. Um, thanks, Jennifer, for putting this together. Um, looking at some of the previous sessions that folks have attended, uh, I think it's interesting that the last one is literally the end of the pipe uh, as far as uh, food production goes uh, that we're looking at. Um, so I manage a rural, a fairly small rural landfill in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Uh, it serves 22 communities, but they're 22 pretty small communities. Um, our population served is about 90,000 people. Um, some of those communities are less than 200 people. So it's a, it's a pretty rural operation, um, but I have a different approach to the way I look at um, managing this facility. Uh, we do have an active landfill here. Uh, we have a, a robust recycling program, a food scrap program uh, here at this, at this facility. Um, so what I'll be talking about today are kind of, it feels like kind of lessons learned over the years about food scrap composting. Um, we've been composting food scraps for about 15 years, and, um, and I'll get into a little bit of that uh, during the presentation. All right, what slide are you looking at? Because that's... I've got three monitors here. I just want to make sure I'm looking at the right one. Um, it's a green outlined. What are we talking about? Composting? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So just with these types of topics, I think it's important to at least create context. Um, everybody seems to have a different definition of uh, composting and compost. Um, composting is a form of waste disposal where organic waste decomposes naturally under uh, organic rich conditions. Um, I think that's a pretty universal broad definition. Uh, it's nature's way of managing waste. You know, you go out into the forest and stick your hand uh, into the soil. Um, that stuff that you pull up is organic matter in the process of composting. So we have this vision of composting that includes equipment like scarabs or front end loaders and very um, resource intensive, but composting happens every day without diesel fuel. Um, but what we're gonna be talking about is a more um, uh, hands-on approach to composting. So the, what I'm looking at is this is a process by which we make compost. Uh, and compost is the end product of the composting process. Um, and there's a bit of uh, pathogen, pathogen reduction and um, nutrient acquisition, blah, blah, blah. Um, you're making soil, essentially. Now, for us, composting is the, you know, uh, triple bottom line. It's resource conservation, as Zach mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, the impacts of food waste. Mark, you have frozen. We're back. You were back. You can start with the triple bottom line again. Okay. So it's, as the slide shows, it's, uh, you know, focused on resource conservation. And Zach gave a wonderful presentation on, on uh, the resources that are going into food waste. I'm not going to get into that detail. Um, for us, there's a financial benefit. Um, and then ultimately, uh, there is a greenhouse gas implication associated with food waste composting. I do want to point out um, that the food recovery hierarchy that's presented by 
EPA is a waste hierarchy. It's, so if you look at that from a greenhouse gas perspective, composting might be in the wrong slot, but from a waste reduction and waste management perspective, it makes all the sense in the world. So be careful on how you look at some of these frameworks and hierarchies. It's important to understand what the end goal is. And for that food recovery hierarchy, the end goal is reducing waste. And Zach is 100% right on that the best way to manage food waste is to not produce it in the first place. Um, our region has some interesting approaches. Uh, there's an organization called Willing Hands, and they actually pick up um, perishable food before it's expired from local grocery stores and redistributes it to uh, senior centers, uh, homeless shelters, and things of that nature, food shelves. So instead of a food shelf just being non-perishable food items, they also distribute um, perishable foods and they have a gleaning program um, at the end of the season where farmers allow uh, low-income families to come and glean up in our, our region to help reduce uh, food insecurity and food waste. The other thing that we've done here through our division in cooperation with a local food co-op is we've done several workshops on how to cook with food waste, um, making things like pesto, chicken stock, vegetable stock, some things that if you ask your grandparents would say is a common practice, um, but for us, it's, it's not. I saw in one of the comments, the use of milk as a uh, plant food. Uh, you can look at milk as a liquid manure uh, at that point, and it does have nutrient value. Um, the quantities and stuff, I am not um, a plant expert, but it does have, uh, ha does have some benefits. Um, but again, the, the important thing to remember is not producing food waste in the first place is the more critical path. So composting for resource conservation, um, for us here at the landfill, there are regulations that require us to operate in a particular fashion. So side slopes have to be controlled for erosion an area is not actively receiving waste for 60 days, have to have 18 inches of topsoil or its equivalent placed to uh, generate or grow grass or some vegetation. So we end up consuming large volumes of virgin topsoil as a result. So 15 years ago, I looked at that requirement and wondered, is there a way to positively impact disposal capacity, accomplish erosion control, and really do something beneficial with all of it. And it came down to extracting organic matter, creating a waste um, generated soil product. And we did have done that for 15 years. Uh, annually, we produce between 10 and 15,000 cubic yards of usable um, product here at our solid waste facility. Um, it results in much better soil health. Uh, we did some tests. At one point, we manufactured a topsoil using short paper fiber uh, and uh, other soil products. Uh, we produced our own compost as well as using topsoil, uh, virgin topsoil. Our product worked the best of the three. Um, the product that we use at our facility is a is an unscreened, unstable, in some cases, compost product. Uh, the reason we do unscreened is because for erosion control, large sticks and other uh, large pieces of carbon, essentially, in the, the compost help divert water and stop um, the generation of you know, little rivulets coming down slopes. So it's, it's actually great for stormwater management and erosion control. Um, we do produce a compost product that's used elsewhere in the city as a mechanism to reduce pesticide and fertilizer applications throughout the city. And I'll get into that a little bit. Um, but as we talk about this, one thing that I always encourage is composting at home is the best option bar none. Um, we're not driving waste around. We're managing it where it's generated. We're using it where it's generated. So we've reduced 
our transportation footprint considerably simply by doing home, home composting. Now, recognizing that I know in our area, and I'm sure in many of yours, single family dwellings are not being built like they used to be. There's a lot of multifamily housing. Even in, in our community, uh, majority of the uh, housing projects that are being built are not single family dwellings. Uh, it's multifamily dwellings that, that feel they don't have access to food scrap um, composting. So we've, we've developed some drop-off options and I, I'll get into that some more. But. So there is a, a financial benefit. We charge a tip fee. Um, so we generate revenue as a result. Um, there's, it's cheaper than landfilling. So for the customer, there's a, they have a financial benefit as well. Um, this image on the screen right now, this is our uh, compostable food scrap permit for residents. So we have two programs. We have a commercial account program and a residential drop-off. This is our residential drop-off program. The resident pays for the permit. Um, they've basically paid an annual fee that is the cost of us managing their compostable products. So they don't have to pay again for the entire year. They pay once. They place this sticker on a five gallon pail and we accept one five gallon pail per household throughout the year. And that's um, typically what the average household, a five gallon pail is adequate. Um, some families that have more people in their family, you know, larger families might need more pails and then they would get multiple permits. Um, it allows us to avoid soil purchases. You know, if we're putting virgin topsoil down on side slopes as we expand the landfill, as it grows larger and um, as we, you know, move around in the operation, Topsoil is expensive, even if you can find it. Um, and then the other piece of it is, you know, this is helping with landfill capacity. Um, currently, we're diverting about 870 tons of food scraps annually, which equates to 2% of our overall MSW, but it equates to about 10% of the food scrap that's going into the landfill that we're currently diverting. And this is a totally voluntary program. We don't New Hampshire doesn't have a mandate. City of Lebanon doesn't have a mandate at this time. Um, that may change in the future, but it um, we're currently diverting about 10% of our food scraps available through our means. So our food scrap drop-off for residents um, with COVID, that's why our uh, staff person is wearing a mask, um, but the resident drops their food scraps into a, a specific dumpster. That dumpster is taken to our composting area for processing. It's a very simple process. Um, we're producing a low value product. Uh, and I actually say that with pride. Um, a lot of facilities are focused on farming operations. All that we're trying to do is grow grass. So as a result, um, we're not concerned if, you know, somebody could throw a chocolate cake in there. It's not a problem. We take bones and meat and dairy. Um, because we're able to maintain higher temperatures, uh, it'll break down those food scraps. As you can see, um, my staff person is throwing a, a bag of food scraps in there. We have a requirement that the food scraps are bagged in a compostable bag. Um, that can be paper or um, a compostable plastic. Now, I know there's a lot, of, um, a lot of discussion about legitimacy of compostable plastics. We require that our compostable plastic products are, B, are, are BPI certified. Um, a couple of years ago, BPI, um, I think it's Biological Product Institute, it's a certification of compostable products. Um, they required a few years ago that their compostable products not contain PFAS because within the industry, they were noticing that a lot of compostable products were containing PFAS. So for those who are not aware, anything that food doesn't stick to likely contains PFAS. So 
because of the concern with PFAS and the toxicity of the waste stream, we require that uh, compostable products be BPI certified. So we take compostable forks and plates and other utensils from restaurants, but we work with those restaurants to ensure that um, those products are certified and do not contain um, nasty chemicals. So this is our food scrap windrow area for um, commercial accounts. So they drop off directly in our composting area. Um, as you can see in the foreground, there's a compostable um, bag um, and we mix, we have a recipe that we use. Um, we mix a cup, uh, two parts yard waste and wood chips to one part food scraps. And we do include a small portion of high carbon wood ash from a biomass plant. And part of the reason for that is the, uh, the high carbon ash acts as an odor control uh, and you know, eliminates odors almost instantly when applied to our, to our piles. Again, the, the feedstocks that we use are pretty typical of other solid waste operations. Uh, I've broken them down into carbon nitrogen or browns and greens. Um, the, the picture in the upper left of the two is our residential drop-off area. So we receive brush, um, which we call clean wood. So for us, clean wood is anything that's not dimensional. Um, there are some facilities that take dimensional lumber in their brush area. We don't. We're very, uh, very specific on that uh, because we use it in our compost operation. So it's just branches, trees, shrubs, things of that nature. And next to the brush area is our leaf and yard waste. Um, we get it bagged or people drop off bulk leaves. We've worked with a number of area landscapers to take their leaf matter, as well as this time of year um, can be a struggle for um, getting enough carbon. But we've found that uh, working with some of the local landscapers, we actually get a lot of bark mulch uh, this time of year because they're cleaning it up. You know, last year's mulch is dirty, so they clean it up and we receive that as a kind of an early carbon shot into our program. Um, we also get wood chips from a number of area tree service companies, and we work with a, a few of the utility companies when they're doing um, right-of-way um, vegetation removal. So for us, anything that's carbon, we take at zero dollars, because for us, it's a challenge to get carbon sources. Um, a number of of areas up here, it's strange to think, well, there's lots of trees around. Uh, for us, people have what's better known as the back 40 and don't necessarily bring their leaves to a solid waste facility. So for us, it can be a challenge to obtain adequate uh, carbon to, uh, to work with some of the food scraps. So as far as the nitrogen process, um, the greens, as it were, uh, represents the food scraps that we get, uh, grass clippings, and we do receive some manures, typically from hobby farms. Uh, so for those who are not familiar with what a hobby farm is, it might be somebody who has five acres of land and a horse. Um, horses produce 40 pounds of manure a day, and you're not going to spread that adequately on five acres of land. Um, so we will on occasion get um, you know, clean outs from hobby farms, typically horse manure. And some people will say, well, horse manure isn't a good manure. It's actually great if you're composting food scraps because horses are not ruminant. Um, you know, they don't have multiple stomachs. So horse manure has got a, a lot of good available carbon in it. Um, and very often when horse stables clean out their horse manure, you get a lot of sawdust from the stables. So it's a high beneficial source of carbon if somebody's looking for carbon. There are some places around us too um, that actually receive uh, seaweed. It's really important to understand your feedstocks and where they're coming from 
Um, we don't have a lot of golf courses and country clubs around us. Uh, as a result, we don't see a high use of pesticides. Uh, we do some basic sampling once a year, um, but for the most part, we're, uh, we're not receiving that type of material. A number of years ago, um, there was a couple of facilities in our region that had received some horse manure and it, it ruined their, their compost because the horse stables were importing hay from Canada and the Canadian farmers were using uh, a pesticide called clopyrrolid, which was not destroyed in the compost process, ended up in the, um, in the end compost and killed a lot of broadleaf um, produce as a result uh, when it was applied to gardens, which again is one reason why we don't distribute to the public. Um, Mark, you've frozen again. Okay, I hear sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so we lost you at the hay from Canada and uh, why you don't uh, share with the public. So that's that's why we don't share with the public is um, I've managed other programs and all it takes is um, killing somebody's tomato plants or rose bushes to ruin your program. Um, there are a lot of other benefits um, to using product within your community. Um, and I'm gonna get into that as well, as far as where our compost is also distributed, not just at the landfill. So again, our end product is a low value product. It allows for greater diversion. A number of organic farmers won't take compostable plastics. As a result, like our local farmer's market is 95% diversion because we require all the vendors to use compostable products um, in their uh, food prep. So we don't have any styrofoam and things like that. So it'll... We lost you again. I think Sorry about that. That's okay. So it's farmers markets, all compostable products. Correct. Yeah. And as a result, it allows us to divert far more um, waste from the waste stream. And many of the restaurants in our area that have decided to move towards uh, compostability um, are able to divert, again, far more waste as a result. So as far as events, waste management, we're able to do a lot with diversion because we have a low value product. And again, it's primarily used for grass production and uh, erosion control. Knowing your, your end markets is critical. And that's what drove a lot of it is, um, there's a number of, there's probably three composters around us, but they're producing a, a farm or homeowner grade compost. And as a result, um, they don't accept compostable products uh, at their facilities. So for us, it made a lot of sense to, uh, to go with a low value product. There's not a lot of composters uh, in our area that do that, uh, have that approach. So here's a picture of our landfill. Uh, these side slopes, uh, anywhere you see grass at our facility, um, it's got compost underneath it. And that's what we use uh, for propagation. It's literally just apply compost and then spread grass seed. And this is what we get. So we're not using tackifiers or anything like that. And in some cases, we're literally manually hand spreading grass seed uh, in multiple acres just by hand. Um, so the, you know, we're not using fertilizers. We're not using tackifiers. 
to stick to slopes. The compost itself is accomplishing that. And we grow grass quite well here. Here's a couple of other pictures where our end compost has ended up. The photo on the left is one of the cemeteries um, in Lebanon. And in the middle of that photo is, is where we use some of the compost. Uh, the stuff in the lower right is just recent construction. So the grass isn't very good, but uh, we're using it in the cemeteries, again, to avoid pesticide and fertilizer applications. So when a grave is dug, uh, instead of using virgin topsoil um, after the grave is, uh, the body is interred, uh, we use compost uh, to, to top dress the area and reseed. On the right hand side is a picture of an old railroad yard that last year there were five buildings, uh, brick buildings in that lot, and um, the buildings were removed. Uh, the brick was brought here uh, for beneficial use in road construction. And then we used our compost to level off the property and to vegetate. So as you can see, what was a, an ugly uh, railroad yard is now a nice green lush yard. Uh, will soon be athletic fields to be used by the public. So greenhouse gas reductions. Um, it's interesting, there's a, there's a little bit of literature out there about the implications of greenhouse gas reductions. Um, just as, a, as an FYI share kind of thing, last night my wife and I watched a movie called Kiss the Ground. Um, for those who have not watched it, I would encourage you to watch it. Um, it's, it's interesting, it talks about the impacts of our agricultural system, not just food production, but agriculture as a whole and its impacts on greenhouse gas uh, production. And there's actually a section on food waste and composting, which I thought was interesting. So some of the greenhouse gas reductions are obvious and some in my mind are not so obvious. The obvious ones include not landfilling food scraps. So what you know, Zach, I thought it was really great that Zach included those survey pieces where there was a large percentage of the population that were surveyed said, well, I'm landfilling it and I'm okay with that. Um, the problem with landfilling food scraps is uh, it falls under this anthropogenic greenhouse gas production equation piece. And what's happening to food scraps and landfills is, first of all, landfills are anaerobic. Um, there is this unfortunate myth that somehow landfills operate like a giant compost pile and they don't. The idea behind landfilling is actually to evacuate oxygen and to evacuate moisture, two very critical components in composting. So for farmers who do haylage or silage, um, it's not an unsimilar um, operation. You know, uh, that that task there is a fermentation process, but it occurs when you remove oxygen. And that's what's happening in a landfill. The net result of food scraps in a landfill are, it's producing nitrous oxide, which has got huge global warming potential, as well as methane. Um, and those are not components that are, that are generated in appreciable amounts in the composting process. They are generated to some degree if the, the pile happens to go anaerobic. And that's usually when you get that stink, foul smell if it's just left. Um, but a pile that's managed um, and turned regularly um, produces very little of those, um, of those greenhouse gases. So that's a big portion of greenhouse gas reduction is by composting it, you're not producing those those uh, greenhouse gases that have a huge global warming potential. The other piece um, is, is the whole transportation reduction. For us here at our facility, we're producing a compost and using the compost locally. So the, the transportation footprint is very small. Uh, we're not importing topsoil, um, but we're also not shipping our food waste out. I mean, our, our landfill is right here. So we're able to manage it locally, 
um, but we're also managing the end product locally, um, which reduces our transportation. Some of the not so obvious um, benefits of, of compost, particularly use at a landfill, um, compost on outside slopes actually acts a bit like a biofilter. Um, compost is used as a biofilter at a number of facilities like sludge composting facilities. Air is collected in the facility and run through compost. And compost grabs hold of some of these nasty things that are, that are in those emissions and binds it up in the compost. So by using compost on the outside slopes, any fugitive emissions that might be coming up through the soils is grabbed by that compost. I don't have any numbers as far as what the you know, efficacy of that is, but it's just, it's an industry practice at, um, at composting facilities. So I just use that same philosophy here um, to help mitigate some of our uh, fugitive emissions. Not using uh, virgin soil products like topsoil um, for slope stabilization allows for some carbon sequestration. Uh, compost holds carbon. Um, so as far as greenhouse gas reduction um, and just growing grass, that operation in and of itself is pulling carbon out of the atmosphere into the ground, into the root mass and throughout the soil and into um, you know, that microbe layer. So you know, stripping topsoil from what would have been farmland removes that potential um, and actually generates and releases carbon into the atmosphere when that, that, um, that soil product is removed. So not doing that eliminates that and we are able to sequester um, with the use of compost. As I mentioned, um, the reduced transportation is not insignificant. Um, managing waste locally reduces transportation and reduces that transportation footprint. And trucks run on diesel. Uh, and the fewer trucks you're moving around, the less diesel emissions are generated. Um, and then not importing virgin topsoil from out of town also has a, a positive impact on our transportation footprint. Um, so again, food scraps are not shipped out. Uh, they're managed locally and the end product is used locally. Again, this is that uh, compost applied to side slopes and having a positive impact on uh, fugitive emissions. Uh, the use and distribution of our end product, as was mentioned before, uh, it is not given out to residents. In my mind, there's a, a better purpose for that. Um, and that's used in and around our solid waste facility. We actually produce two types of uh, compost here. One is a food waste compost and one is a yard waste compost. The food waste compost is used on the landfill um, and the yard waste compost is used around the city. Um, and it's just uh, politically, it was easier to do it this way than um, there is a yuck factor when people learn that we're using waste products um, that are making their way into parks. So um, because we use so much compost on site, um, we were able to just divert food scraps and use it right on site. And as I mentioned, we're using it on the yard waste compost is used um, without, um, without any issues on our city parks, athletic fields, and uh, throughout our cemeteries. It's important to monitor and test your compost. Um, so we take temperatures of our piles to watch at our, uh, our activity, see what's going on. It helps determine frequency of turning. Uh, many of the rules and regulations specify a number of turns, which we're able to accomplish, but we use temperature as a, as a deciding factor on when, when to turn. Um, we do some soil testing just to see what the nutrient levels are in the soil, um, which helps with our process. We discovered that we were adding too much uh, of the wood ash to our pile. So that was changing the structure and nature of our, our end compost. Um, so we've, we've backed off on that. Um, 
but it's also important to understand heavy metals and PFAS testing. Uh, some people might wonder where might that stuff be coming from? Um, you know, you'd be surprised what's in our food scraps um, as far as pesticides and other chemicals, um, as well as the compostable products. Um, we try to keep as much of the PFAS and, and you know, non-certified compostable products out, but it's important to have an understanding what's going in there. And we monitor our customers, but some things always slip through. Some food scrap program considerations. Outreach is critical, especially to the general public. Um, there's a lot of confusion about what's okay and what's not. Um, because we're, a, we're defined as an industrial compost process, that's very different than your backyard composting um, container. So what we're able to compost is very different than uh, what might be acceptable in a backyard composting bin. Um, and not all compostables are created equal. Um, earlier, we were talking about, you know, how petroleum products were created and, you know, uh, fungi weren't available to break down lignans. Um, so lignans are those really hard, thick cell walls in things like trees and woody plants that are difficult to compost. So if you're using only wood chips as your carbon source, you're going to struggle to produce a good product and it's going to smell bad because the uh, carbon is not bioavailable in a wood chip. Uh, you need a combination of wood chips and leaves, you know, to create that bioavailable carbon source. Knowing your customers, as I mentioned earlier about the golf courses and horse stables um, or hobby farmers, those are critical to understand where are you getting your hay, What's your application of pesticides and fertilizers on grass and how is that making its way into your compost operation or not? Um, staff training, it took us years to get my staff to understand um, how to turn windrows. Um, and it seems like a simple notion, but to take a bunch of guys who had been landfilling for, for 20 years to try to get them to manage a pile of waste very differently, it, it took some time to get them to understand the importance of turning and frequency of turning. Um, so that did take some time. We work with our local cooperative extension um, agents to develop a recipe uh, and to better understand our composting and, and the end compost and how it would be used. Um, when we get unusual requests, um, we we go through the cooperative extension. We have a, a wood stove company in our area that is a soapstone wood stove. So they have a lot of soapstone dust. Um, and when that, you know, when that was approached, as far as is this a product we could use in our compost, uh, there was question about its, its nutrient availability and benefit. Uh, so we do continue to work with cooperative extension on some of these odd, um, odd requests. Uh, we work with um, Fish and Wildlife Services when they have to do uh, some animal kills or DOT, our Department of Transportation, uh, when they do pick up some road kills. So we do receive carcasses here at our facility and, and they compost very well uh, at these high temperatures. Other issues to consider are site management like mud and vectors. You know, can you access your facility in the winter? Not just your equipment, but can your customers access the bins and things of that nature? As I mentioned earlier about compostable products, um, BPI is the, is the organization that we use. Um, and there's a variety of companies out there that, that supply compostable products. Um, you can get them on Amazon, but you can, if you're looking at them and you're going, wow, these are so much cheaper, they're probably made in a foreign country using a lot of pesticides and other chemicals. Um, so it's really important to understand where products are coming from. Um, and so that's why we focused on BPI and we work with BPI to understand compostability of some of these products because we were hearing it from customers. We have a couple of large employers that have multiple cafeterias for their staff. 
Um, we have a local hospital, um, and we've worked with all those campuses to identify uh, compostable products and what makes sense as far as increasing diversion and, and still making a good end product. And that concludes my presentation. So thank you for your patience and I apologize for blinking out a couple of times. Oh, that is okay because your presentation was so fantastic. I really appreciated it. Um, if people have questions, please put it in the question and answer box at the bottom of at least my screen. I'm also going to launch a, um, a simple uh, poll on Mark's talk. Um, I just want to applaud you because it, you know it takes a community to deal with a community. And I think that actually you are not a landfill manager, you are a community manager. I can't believe how many people you have and organizations and types that you've worked with in order to connect the dots so that waste is no longer a waste. It is a resource that reinvigorates the community. And I just I just think it's such an inspiration that 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 you're doing golf courses and hobby farms and restaurant flatware and and um, events based opportunities. I, I just I I I I just I I'm rambling. Um, I have a question. Sure. How did you get, I've tried to get my grocery store in New York City where we banned plastic bags um, to have compostable bags so that uh, our food waste in New York City can go in the compostable bags, which then go into the food waste recycling program. Sure. And the, the, the grocery stores refuse. Um, I'm just wondering how, how, how do you approach these community members in order to engage them in this process? Because you, you're not using carrot and stick, you're using let's just do it. And, it, and it's really beautiful. So there's a, a, uh, an outreach philosophy that I employ on a number of different levels. Over the years, I've just, I take classes on outreach and how to communicate better to audiences and, and the public. Um, and one that works really well is something called community-based social marketing. And that method was perfected by a guy named Doug McKenzie Moore. He's a Canadian and has done amazing things, moving a community in different directions. An example that we've done here, um, we started about five years ago with a program called, um, see if we can see this, Refill Not Landfill. Um, and so for the month of April, instead of focusing on recycling better, we focus on stop making waste completely. Um, so we ask a number of businesses and residents to pledge for the month of April to reduce their waste impacts. And during that month, COVID was a huge challenge and we actually had to hit the brakes a little bit. Um, but during that month, we asked people to use you know, instead of doing things like compostable bags, did you need the bag? And just asking questions every day, do I need this? You know, back to what Zach was talking about, that source reduction and waste reduction are really what we should be focusing on. And not so much on how do I compost this food waste, but how do I stop making the food waste to begin with? And then what I can't avoid, that's what I'm managing. Um, so for the last five years, We've partnered, the city of Lebanon has partnered with a local food co-op that has three stores. We've presented the concept to a, a Northeast cooperative grocery store. Um, we've seen this program grow in different places. So this is the community-based social marketing. One technique is um, the example that I have that I think a lot of people can connect with is the show Candid Camera. And years ago, there was this program called Candid Camera, and it was, it was a joke kind of show, but it had some serious psychological and human elements to it. Um, one that sticks out in my mind is um, a person is walking into a delicatessen, and there's a sign right on the door that says, don't step on the white squares. And as they walk in, there's white and black squares. And at what we refer to as the moment of decision, 
you're instructed what to do. And so then they videotape the person kind of walking in and only stepping on the black squares. The, the customer doesn't ask why, they're just told at that moment to um, not, not do a particular thing. So we've worked with customers um, in the area to um, rename their garbage barrels, landfill barrels, um, to make people realize this is where it's going. Um, we're doing workshops, we're doing, and understanding that everybody learns in different ways. We've developed an app and the app actually helps people understand what's compostable and what's not, what's recyclable, what's not. Um, we have a searchable website. And so there's a lot of things, lots of moving parts with all of this. Um, and that's the critical part is there's no like brochure or bumper sticker that's going to make that move. And even if you replace plastic bags with compostable bags, you may not end up with the result you're hoping for. I've seen some communities ban plastic bags only to find a bureaucratic loophole that allows retailers to actually use thicker plastic bags as a result, generating more plastic. Um, so I've seen that multiple times because I've been asked to support plastic bans and I'm concerned about, about them for that very reason that the end result in many cases results in more plastic waste generation. Um, so for the last several years for me, my focus has, has been less on recycling better and more on stop making the waste in the first place. You know, let's not talk about how to recycle plastic better. Let's stop making it in the first place. Peter, Sorry that was long-winded, but I'm I very passionate it. about that. <laughs> Go Peter with your question. Thank you. So I, I think you've given a hint on, on the answer to this, but I, I don't remember the exact number, but you're getting something like 10% diversion of food scraps. Yeah. So my, my question is for a really ambitious greenhouse gas target, you know, so for your kind of uh, ideal fantasy of where you'd like to be and your municipality to be by 2050, um, you know, I'm curious, uh, your system seems really well designed for, like you say, uh, for the purpose you're using it, right? So, but you'll saturate the capacity to use the compost on your landfill and on public spaces. If you got up to 90% diversion. <laughs> um, so I'm just curious if you can say something about that scaling issue, because, sure. you know, my perception is as we go to more ambitious diversion goals, we're gonna to have to not just tweak the system, but, but there'll be new issues that come up. Right. So it's important in any project, it's so critical to identify your goals and everybody understand those goals. Um, if greenhouse gas reduction is my goal, I might stop composting completely. We have an active gas collection system, which um, captures that gas and is pretty efficient at destroying um, those greenhouse gases. It does generate some greenhouse gas emissions as a result, um, but it reduces a lot of the greenhouse gases. So if my focus were 100% greenhouse gases, I might say, um, I'm gonna stop composting and just landfill everything and capture it. Um, that's one reason why it concerns me that we see this huge move towards anaerobic digestion because anaerobic digestion is merely extracting the energy from those components. And you're still resulting in a product that in some cases is not usable. It's still producing a sludge. Um, and very often what we're seeing now in, in many of our rural states is a banning of land application of sludges. So as a result, anaerobically digested material ultimately is volume reduced and then will very likely be landfilled. Um, I've seen a lot of programs that, that are promoting these, these energy programs through anaerobic digestion, but it's still being landfilled. So although it is waste reduction by volume, it's still not accomplishing that. 
But to your question specifically, Peter, about saturation, for our area, even as rural as it is, you can never get enough compost. Um, I am out of compost, and this morning the Parks Department contacted me. They've got a project, and they needed some compost. I, we used all of it on that railroad project last year, so we're in the process of creating something now, um, but it takes time. Um, I can't just flick a switch. Um, we have an old castle gravel pit right across the street from us. They've approached us and said, we'll buy all of your compost because the state of Vermont, who's a neighbor of ours, requires 25% of their um, Vermont transportation compost or topsoil to contain compost. And to create a, comp a topsoil, forgive me, a topsoil product in Vermont, legally you have to have 25% compost in it. And there aren't sufficient quantities locally to produce that product. So I'm not worried about distribution of it, even on a low value product scale. Um, I think what we're gonna see is more and more people wanting more and more. Um, organic matter in our soil is depleting and getting more and more difficult to find. And a great way to return organic matter to our soil is through compost. Um, I've worked with a number of farmers to move away from a manure spraying operation to move into a compost operation and then incorporate compost into their soils because the spraying contributes to stormwater and very often, you know, just is so li literally fluid. It's just moving off of the soils. Compost allows for a greater incorporation into soils. So I don't see it going away. I think it's gonna get more and more of a desired product. Soil. <laughs> the, the limiting factor that I find, and I think this is why anaerobic digestion is so popular, is carbon. Um, it really takes some effort and some, some careful planning to make sure you've got adequate sources of, com of carbon throughout the year. You know, we think about leaf and yard waste, but leaves come primarily in the fall, um, and you don't want them to break down. So We've encouraged people to use um, paper bags if they're collecting them commercially. And then that retards the uh, decomposition process by keeping it in a paper bag. So they overwinter nicely, and then they're available in the spring when we're, we have a huge shortage of uh, available carbon. Okay, so Francis asks, how did you get the program started at the landfill? I imagine there were a lot of complications actually starting something on that scale. So who did you talk to and what rules policies were in place that allowed you or had to be put in place for you to do these things? So when we started composting over a decade ago, the state of New Hampshire had a very complicated permitting process. So I used to work for the state of New Hampshire, um, so I understood the rules and I understood the bureaucracy of it. So I played with the system a bit. We composted physically on the landfill for over 10 years. So when the state asked, what are you doing with food waste? I'm landfilling it. It's always within the footprint of the landfill. So I didn't need a permit. We were the only landfill doing this in New Hampshire. Nobody else was composting food scraps because it was so complicated. But it was viewed as MSW. We managed it within the footprint of the landfill. The end product was applied to the outside slopes of the landfill. So theoretically and bureaucratically, it was landfilled. But we had removed it from there and replaced a virgin product with it. That's how we got started. And we started very small scale. Uh, the, uh, the local hospital was interested in diverting food scraps. So we worked with them. Um, getting that program going. There was a local um, food scrap program at a, at a college that was failing. Um, so I, I just approached them. Um, my employer, the city of Lebanon is extremely supportive of some of these crazy ideas that I have. So far, I've not had any, any issues with, with the city of Lebanon. They're, they're very excited about what we're doing here. It has a positive impact on disposal. It's keeping it local. It's on so many levels. It's just, it's really working well. Um, so I'm not flaunting, 
you know, the fact that I went against the rules in some regard for composting, because I actually approached the state about it and said, this is what I'm going to do. And they said, Mark, you're absolutely right. You're, that's completely within the bounds because you're controlling vectors, you're controlling leachate, you're, you know, I was controlling everything within the footprint of the landfill. So it was an acceptable practice and it allowed my staff to learn how to do it. So if, the, if for some reason we fell down, we're on the landfill, it's pretty forgiving, we can make this work. Um, so we would compost along side slopes. So when the, when the piles were done, all we did was push them over and just move them down slope. So, you know, to minimize movement um, and it just, it. We lost you again. I don't want to end five minutes early because of the technical difficulty. There's so much oh. good stuff here. Oh, we're waiting for, for Mark to come back. Uh, Hi there. Great. Uh, Sorry. So the end of the story is I got a permit and we're, we're legal and uh, New Hampshire has finally, uh, we worked quite a bit with the state of New Hampshire to rewrite their composting rules. Um, I participate in um, legislative study committees regularly. Um, so I'm really engaged with the state um, just to keep things going. Two weeks ago, I gave a landfilling 101 class to legislators on what actually is landfilling, that it's not simply burying things in a hole because um, they're working on new rules. Um, so a lot of this is just education. Um, but it's also that piece about community-based social marketing. If, if you want somebody to do something different, sometimes it's not about convincing them that this is the right thing to do. Don't you understand what's happening? Sometimes it's just putting it in front of them and saying, this is the way we're going. Like what we did at the farmer's market, you don't have an option. Where the city had control over a waste generation, we set a policy where all vendors have to use compostable products. Um, it's either compostable or recyclable. Those are your options. So we went from 95% disposal, 5% diversion. In less than two weeks, we literally flipped that. Um, I did the same thing at a local hospital um, where we flipped their diversion rate. Uh, they had a 60-40 split, 60% disposal, 40% diversion. We changed some of the fiddlings with their program. Um, and within two weeks, we had 60% diversion and 40% uh, disposal. So with some simple tweaking and not this, oh, come on, you know, legislating it and things like that, we were playing on human norms and social mores and all those types of things and just moving people in the direction we wanted them to go. Um, and very often we, we're creatures of habit and we're, we're gonna follow the crowd and if you get enough people moving in the direction, a lot of people are gonna come along with. So our food scrap program, residential drop-off has about 300 households participating and there's nothing making them do it. We created an, an economic incentive because it's cheaper. Um, our community, because of the work we've been doing, I think is really um, very interested in reducing its waste and impact on the environment as a result of years of you know, this background grassroots work, um, but we have a lot of support here that I know a lot of places don't have. So we have a very unique situation. So I'm just curious, how do we start thinking about these ideas nationally across the division or the sector of landfill? Like, like are there ways in which or avenues that you can imagine or you can suggest or direct us to in order to get this cross-fertilization of programs like yours across state boundaries and then sort of infiltrate the whole land? So it's, it's really challenging. Right now, I think we're still figuring out the impact of COVID. Um, and I know we're all sick of hearing this, 
but um, it has really impacted the way we do everything. Um, the waste we generate is different. You know, we're shopping from home more, so there's more cardboard. Um, people are not, like we've seen a huge increase in construction and demolition debris. People aren't building homes, they're remodeling and they're doing it in some cases themselves or with small local contractors. So it's, the way stream has changed. Um, there's this movement towards local. Um, and I know Zach was talking about that with healthier diets. Um, I think some of it is just making sure people understand some basic principles. Um, our society has changed considerably where in the past, you know, our grandmother might have taught us how to can or how to properly, you know, when you come home with, with hamburger, but you're not going to eat it for a couple of days, throw it in the freezer. You don't have to, you know, nothing. Some of the, the solutions are really simple. Um, I think back to a question that I got from a resident and it was this woman called up and she was very upset that we didn't have a juice box um, recycling option for her. And she went on and on about what am I going to do about the juice box? And so I, she finished and then I turned the tables and I said, if you're concerned about the juice box, stop making it. Make your child juice out of a concentrate and just give them a reusable container. She was thrilled with the answer, but never thought of it on her own. And I think that's where we are as a culture. So we really need to, I, the short answer, Jennifer, is I don't have the answer because stuff has changed so much so rapidly. This paradigm shift is unbelievable. But what hasn't changed is how we think and function as human beings and that we want other people to like us. That's one thing. Um, so creating uh, local champions is really important. Doing something on a national level, I think is tricky. Somehow it's gotta be cool or, or in. Um, the stuff that I've seen, the programs we've done here locally, I think work locally because we've worked with so many different avenues, you know, and hit so many different levels where we have an employer doing composting in the cafeteria at work. And then there's composting available here. So it's at, it's in different places. It's not just Mark's doing this crazy sticker campaign. Uh, there's all these other elements to it. Um, lots of, like I said, lots of moving parts. I, I mean, I'd be interested in participating in something like that. I don't think it's a one off, there's no silver bullet. It's literally multiple avenues um, at different levels. You know, I mean, people of, you know, in the twenties you know, have a different thought process from the people in their thirties. Um, it's very different. Um, you know, people are like you guys, you, you know, you're working from home, I'm presuming. Um, it, so it's, are so much is very different. Access to these services are very different. I'd be interested to see Zach's slides that had stuff from 2018. I'd be interested to see 2021 and 2022 um, because our waste practices are different at home than they are at work because you've got to deal with it. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see that dynamic, um, but there's a, lot, there's a lot going on and I don't think we're done yet, but. Any last comments you'd like to share before we end today's webinar? I, the only thing I have is, is just that um, the waste reduction piece is critical, but that composting plays an amazing role in not only reducing greenhouse gases, but can in fact have a positive impact in uh, sequestering um, carbon. Um, you know, and doing regenerative exercises you know, is really a, a critical piece of this. Simply reducing our emissions is not enough. We've got to do something to remove some of the carbon out of the atmosphere and get it back into the soil, um, you know, and, and go at it that way. Um, I'd mentioned earlier when it was just the panelists talking that um, I've spent some time just very, very loosely looking into regenerative farming and how can we incorporate that into a landfill operation? And that's kind of where some of the food scrap philosophies have come from, um, but also some of the other philosophies. Uh, our recyclables in Lebanon are not exported. 
Um, sometimes we take a hit financially, but we move as much as we can locally, uh, again, to reduce transportation footprints. So it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach, um, and it's not for the faint at heart. It's a, it's a considerable amount of work um, to do. So um, I'm happy to, uh, to talk with others offline. Um, it's, it's obviously a passion of mine. Soil health is actually a big passion of mine uh, and getting waste back into the soil. Um, not all waste should go back into the soil, but organic material should go back into the soil as a soil amendment um, and improve organic matter uh, in our depleted soils. Thank you Thanks. so much, Mark. This was a wonderful presentation. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.